Well, good morning, Walden Church. You know, sometimes from up here, I will mention Sunday school, right? And by that, I mean Sunday school when we all were kids, right? When we went to church, uh, when we were young, I've been to church my entire life. I, I don't even know another way to live. I had parents who did not sit home on Sunday. They were never watching the game on TV, which means I had a lot of Sunday school teachers because not only did I attend Sunday school every Sunday morning, but I can remember at least four churches uh, my parents attended as I was growing up. So we know all the stories, right? <laughs> what, what are some of the stories? There's, uh, what? Daniel in the lion's den, yeah. Uh, Jonah, Noah, David and Goliath, yes. Uh, Moses, the Exodus, Ten Commandments, of course. Let's not forget Jesus, <laughs> right? Uh, Joshua's popular, uh, teaching the parables, that's popular. Samson, of course, Joseph's coat. Those are all great stories. Now, of course, I was named after a Bible character, named after King David. The name David means beloved. And uh, I have a strong love for his character, especially the story David and Goliath. David is a skinny, scrawny, short little guy who goes up against a hulking giant and he has nothing but a slingshot and courage and he wins, right? Look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're three friends, they're taken as prisoners of war and they refuse to worship false idols even though they live in a foreign country. And the cops come and say, you better worship these idols or we'll kill you. And they're like, uh, we don't care. <laughs> How awesome is that? They were so brave. And then they got thrown into the fire and the Bible says, now it looks like there's four guys in there. And then when they come out, they don't even smell like smoke. Daniel in the lion's den, same story. You know, they said, hey, we threw your friends in the fire, so you better, you better start worshiping. And Daniel says, I'm not worshiping your gods either. And then they said, well, well then we'll throw you into a, a pit of hungry lions. And Daniel's like, bring it on. And so he's brave and God protects him in the lion's den. And we love these stories. Our Bible heroes are heroes because the stories are worth reading. They're, they were not afraid. They took risks. They obeyed. Joseph, his dad buys him a fancy coat. His brothers get jealous. They sell him into slavery. Joseph, even though he is a slave, he never gives up. He never throws in the towel. He never quits. He, he never keeps his head down. He never goes with the flow. And God rewards him for his bravery. Joseph goes from slave to second in command of all of Egypt. I mean, who remembers the song they taught us in Sunday school? They taught us a song, right? My God is so great, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. The mountains are his, the rivers are his, the stars are his handiwork too, right? My God is so great, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. I remember as a kid, I used to build homemade ramps for my bike out of wood and cinder blocks. And I would go as fast as I could down the street and I would just see what I could jump over. My friends and I would cross a, a busy street. We'd ride 20 minutes from my house to an abandoned uh, lot park that we called Bohemian. And it was filled with water and mud and old construction trash. And we would jump our bikes down there. When my brother and I were kids, we used to jump off the roof of our house for fun. <laughs> we used to climb the fence at the local pool and go swimming at night. As a kid, I did a lot of dumb stuff. Stuff I would never do now as an adult. And I could tell myself, well, you know, it's because I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm wiser now and uh, I'm more grown up and I'm more mature. But the truth is, I'm too scared. Kids are brave. Kids will try anything. Kids will do anything because our heroes were Davy Crockett and Daniel Boone and Zorro and Superman and Flash Gordon. Well, I mean, 
mine were. But see, when I was a kid, not only was I brave, I was indestructible. I also believed that God was big, that he would protect me. I mean, why wouldn't he? He protected all of my Bible heroes. When I was young, I honestly believed that God had my back. I wasn't worried about life. I wasn't worried about the future. I'm sure God would help me graduate. God would help me get married. God would help me get a job. God would help me have kids. God would help me when I retire. In fact, I don't even need a retirement plan because I have God. And then we get older. <laughs> what happens to us? What happens to us when we get older? I mean, we get older, wiser, more mature. We start making plans. We start being responsible. We start making better choices. And that all sounds well and good, but along with that, it seems we also lose our courage. As we grow up, we listen more and more to the world around us. We thought we could change the world, but we can't. We thought we could make a difference, but I guess we can't. We thought we knew a lot, we thought we were smart, but the world actually tells you that all those choices you made when you were young were dumb. <laughs> and you better wise up. Don't raise your hand. Don't volunteer. Don't stand out. Don't stand up. I mean, what's the point, right? I mean, if, if in the end you just end up falling off your bike and you get hurt, you're going to fall into the street. Everyone's going to laugh at you. You better just keep that idea to yourself. As you grow up, you lose your boldness. We lose our bravery. We tell ourselves it's because we're more mature or because we're being careful now or we're making wise investments. We're being good stewards. But perhaps the truth is we're just afraid. As you grow up, the world makes you afraid to try. We tell David's story because he did the impossible. Moses and Joshua did the impossible. Samson, he was superhuman. Peter walked on water. How? Well, for one, they certainly were not listening to that voice that says, you better sit this one out. You know, somebody else is going to volunteer. Somebody else can do this better than us. One of the church fathers Tertullian, he said, the Lord challenges us to suffer persecutions and to confess him. He wants those who belong to him to be brave and fearless. He himself shows how weakness of the flesh is overcome by courage of the spirit. A Christian is fearless. Remember when you were in Sunday school and you heard those stories? What happened before? Story time. Song time, right? You'd sing some songs. And when you did those songs, you stood up, you moved your hands, you moved about, you did all the, you, you projected, you sang out, you weren't afraid to sing out loud. What happened? <laughs> what happened? You, you could raise your hands now when you sing. Raise my hands? I don't even sing loud enough for the person next to me to hear me. Why not? Remember when you were a kid, you sang loud and bold, you jumped around? Where does our courage go? When I was a kid, I guess, I thought that when I was an adult, I would actually become braver. I thought that I would be bold. I'd be taller and stronger and smarter. So naturally, I would do all of those heroic things. Problem is being smarter made me more self-aware, more keenly aware of my mortality, my insufficiencies, my inadequacies. But what about God? He's still big. He's still strong. He's still mighty. Isn't there nothing that he can't do? And he can certainly still use you. You know, we, we mentioned the Ten Commandments and, and all those stories of Moses and Egypt, and we typically tell those stories that take place before the Red Sea. Those are the good stories. The stories that take place after the Red Sea, that's when Israel lost her bravery. 
It took them 40 years to get to the promised land, right? Nope. <laughs> the Bible says they got there in just under two weeks. It's true. The problem was what happened when they got there. In Numbers 13, God had led Israel away from the Egyptians. They're on their way to the promised land. In fact, they're just a few short steps away from the promised land. And so they send spies to check it out. And the spies are gone for 40 days, investigating everything and creating a report. And in verse 25, they come back and they give their report. It says at the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out the land. And they came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told them, we came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. So they're gone for 40 days. They come back and they say, it's as good as God said. God promised them before they even got there that it would be a land flowing with milk and honey and they come back and confirm it. They say it's everything God promised. It's just like God said. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong and the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Who is Anak? Anak's a guy in the Bible that was really tall. The Amalek. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the Negeb, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the hill country, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the Jordan. All of this that they're reporting now, this is all fear. They're saying, we don't want to go in there because their numbers are great, there's a lot of them, and they're tall. That's, that's it, they're tall. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Caleb basically says, I ain't worried. In fact, let's just all go right now. He's <laughs> no plan. He's like, let's just go right now. I'm not afraid. Then the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report. Why didn't the Israelites step into the promised land a lot sooner? Because the initial report was, the people are tall. That's it. Hey guys, you know what? Let's be responsible. I mean, let's think this through. Let's count our blessings. I think we're just all lucky to be alive. And Caleb says, no, 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 we can do this. We've, we've gone up against bigger foes in the past, and God is on our side. God promised us this land, right? Let's take it. Did you ever wonder why they get lost? Ever wondered why they wandered the desert for 40 years? Why 40 years? It's in the next chapter, Numbers 14. God says, how long shall this wicked generation grumble against me? I've heard the grumblings of the people of Israel, which they grumble against me. Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord, what you have said in my hearing, I will do to you. Your dead body shall fall in the wilderness and all of your number listed in the census from 20 years old and upward who have grumbled against me. Not one shall come into the land where I swore that I would make you dwell except Caleb, but your little ones who you said would become a prey I will bring in and they shall know the land that you have rejected. According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, 40 days, a year for each day, you shall bear your iniquity 40 years and you shall know my displeasure. I, the Lord, have spoken. Surely this will I do to all the wicked congregation who are gathered together against me in the wilderness. They shall come to a full end and there they shall die. And then the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land who returned and made all the congregation grumble against him by bringing up a bad report about the land. The men who brought up the bad report of the land died by plague before the Lord. Of those men who went to spy out the land, only Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jethu, remained alive. God says, you thought waiting 40 days for the spies to come back, you thought that was a long time? A year for every day. Punishment. You will walk for 40 years until every single one of you is dead. If you were 20 years old or older, you weren't gonna make it. And the spies, 
they died right now. Everyone except Joshua and Caleb. There are certainly other voices in the world that we listen to, right? And I, I've heard those voices too, okay? You can't save everyone. People want to be poor. You can't change the world. It's a different world today. Things have changed. It's not like when we were young. God wanted to give these people a new land, a new home. He promised, flowing with rivers of blessing. And God said, go and take it. And Caleb said, everyone, follow me. And the people went, eh, but they're tall. Deuteronomy 31 says, be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. 1 Corinthians says, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Remember when you were a kid? You were fast, you were strong, you were brave, you were weird, and most of all, you trusted. You trusted that when you jumped off the roof, you would not break your femur. You jumped off that rope swing into the river and you weren't worried about parasites. Yeah, <laughs> I did a lot of dumb things when I was a kid. Did you? Or were you just brave? You wanna hear how the story of Caleb ends? The story of Caleb ends 45 years later in Joshua 14. Caleb says, behold, the Lord has kept me alive just as he said. These 45 years since the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel walked in the wilderness, and now, behold, I am this day 85 years old. I am still as strong as today as I was the day that Moses sent me. My strength now is as my strength was then for war and for going and coming. So now give me this hill country of which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day how the Anakim were there and with great fortified cities. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall drive them out, just as the Lord said. An 85-year-old man said that. He said, I was here. I was here on this very spot 45 years ago and now I'm back. And back then, we were too afraid to drive out our enemies, but I'm back. And he says, and I'm just as strong. He says, let's go claim our homeland. Caleb is 85. You know what he doesn't say? Oh, all that war and all that fighting, oh, that, that's a game for the young. He doesn't say that. Instead, he says, I believe even more now. I'm even stronger now. I'm just as bold, just as brave as I was when I was young. You see, when you're young, you actually believe that when you put that white hat on, it transforms you into that hero. You actually believe those cap guns are real six shooters. When you ride your bike, you really believe I'm Evil Knievel and that creek bed, that's Snake River. You had the number 12 on the back of your jersey and you said, I'm Roger Staubach. I'm sorry, ladies, I don't have an example of what it's like to grow up as a little girl. I mean, who, did, who did you look up to? Mary Lou Retton? I don't, I don't know. My point is we used to have dreams. There was this person that we wanted to be things we wanted to do, things we wanted to say, but as we grew up and we had setbacks and we had failures and we had heartbreak, we stopped taking risks and we stopped being brave. But God is still God and God is still big and he is still great and he still has your back. And with that, there are still dreams and there are still goals, and there are still bold things that he wants you to do. It's 2023. It's a fresh new year to live in, to play in. I want to be like Caleb. You know, the world outside says God doesn't exist. The world outside says that there is no heaven, and if there's no heaven, then there's no hope. The world says play it safe. The world says, keep your head down. The world says, mind your own business. And you know what? The world also says, you'll never amount to anything. And they're right if you do all those things. 
If you keep your head down, if you mind your own business, if you play it safe, they're right. We have moms today that are worried about their kids, worried that their kids won't grow up perfect and worried that they're not good moms, worried that they don't do enough. We have dads today that are worried that they won't be able to provide for their kids or that, that they weren't a good dad. We worry about our grandkids and the world that they get to inherit. We worry about oil and pollution and the stock market and global warming and the threat of World War III. Goliath is real, isn't he? The giant, the monster that mocks us, that threatens us, the one that reminds us that we are weak and insignificant. I want to read you one more story and then we'll, and then we'll go. Jesus has gone to heaven and the disciples, Peter and John, they're preaching. Well, of course they are, right? They're Peter and John. No, no, not of course they are. Peter and John are both blue-collar fishermen, okay? That was their life. Not, they weren't sport fishermen. They weren't leisure activity fish, fishermen. They were fishermen because they had to be. Acts 4 says, as Peter and John were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day. For it was already evening, but many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. Okay, stop. What did you just read? Two fishermen were preaching about Jesus, and they helped 5,000 people become Christians. How? On the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. So all the religious bigwigs, right? All the, all the heavyweights, they all get together. These are the smart guys, okay? These are the educated guys. They get together and try to figure this all out. And when they had said them in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name do you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were educated, common men, and they were astonished. We all read that, right? We all read the same thing. Peter and John are not afraid of this council, not afraid of prison. And the rabbis see that Peter and John are not eloquent like they are, not refined like they are, not mature like they are. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. In other words, they got, they got nothing. You can't refute this. This guy was crippled, now he's not. What, what are they going to do? The evidence is, is right there. There's no argument. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this, in this name. This is their, <laughs> this is their big plan. <laughs> This is what they've come up with. They're wrong. They know it. They knew the power of Peter and John spoke for itself. They couldn't refute it. It's a miracle. It took place. They admit it. And then one guy says, oh, 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 I know. We'll just ask them kindly to stop. Let's, let's see if it works. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot 
but speak of what we have seen and heard. So Peter and John say, no. <laughs> Actually, what they said is, if it's between obeying you and obeying God, we're going we're gonna to stick with God. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom the sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported the, what the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathering together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Notice by the end of all of it, Peter and John didn't lose their boldness. They didn't lose their bravery. They had a setback. And even the authorities came and told them to stop. What do you think? I think it all hinges on this one verse. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. It was obvious. They could see it. In other words, Peter and John were not alone. Did you ever notice that it's easier to jump into the deep end when you're holding the hand of someone else? When you know that you're not alone, that gives you boldness. Joshua 1 says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And Jesus said something very similar. He promised us something very similar. He says, I am with you always to the end of the age. In verse 13, uh, the temple leaders realized that Peter and John were unschooled, ordinary men. Apparently, Peter and John did not have a doctoral degree from the University of Jerusalem. They lacked the training that the rabbis had. Now, does that mean those two guys were dumb? No. I'm sure as good Jewish men, they had memorized portions of the Torah. They were very familiar with the Old Testament Sunday school stories, just like you. But you know what I think? I think as Peter and John were teaching the people in the temple, and as they healed the lame man, the priests and the Sadducees, who had been trained for things like this, they now see these ordinary men doing what they are supposed to be doing. Plus, they're even more disturbed because they're teaching about Jesus and that he was not dead and that he was alive. Because these are the same religious leaders who were also upset with Jesus earlier. When Jesus taught people, and even they recognized back then, they said that Jesus spoke with authority. Well, now God is using ordinary fishermen to preach. God is using ordinary men to work extraordinary miracles, even in the life of this crippled man. I don't know about you, but personally, I feel ordinary most days. In fact, there are some days when I feel less than ordinary. Rarely do I go out and accomplish something. I'm not proud of that. But I think that's where a lot of us live. We, we really don't expect to hit a home run every day. Uh, just getting on base, that would be nice, right? You know, I'll, I'll take the walk. In fact, I'll lean into it and get hit by the ball every now and then. Guess what? God wants to prepare us to be more than that. He wants to prepare us for all those greater works that Jesus talked about. He, he wants us to spend some time with him so that we will rise above the ordinary because it all hinges on this one verse and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Being with Jesus is what makes the difference for the disciple. And it's going to make all the difference for you. You can find your courage again. I think you can be brave again. And you can do those extraordinary things by the power of the Spirit if you are willing to step out in obedience. In John 14, Jesus says, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. Did you catch all that that Jesus said? 
He said, if you love me, you'll obey me. If you love me, you'll show me. You know, Eliza Doolittle said the same thing in My Fair Later. She said, words, words, I'm sick of words. I get words all day through, first from him, now from you. Is that all you blighters can do? Don't talk of stars burning above. If you're in love, show me. Tell me no dream is filled with a desire. If you're on fire, show me. God does not want to hear how much you love him. He wants you to show it by your obedience. He wants you to be brave and to take risks. You know, we often pick and choose what we want to obey from the Bible. And we obey the things that come easy, come natural to us. But when God reveals something to us in his word, or when we read it, or when we hear it in a sermon or a teaching, how many times will we just excuse it and say, ah, I know, but... God will understand. He'll see that at least I'm trying. What areas of obedience do you struggle with the most? Where do you lack bravery? It is in how you treat people. Is it in areas of honesty? Areas of money? Evangelism? It's crucial that we learn to obey God. Listen, I hope you never have the choice that Peter and John did, to choose between obeying earthly authorities or to obey God. But if you do, we need to have our mind made up already that we're going to obey God over the world because it all hinges on this one verse and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Have you been with Jesus lately? How's your courage holding up? Are you ready to let God do something extraordinary through you? How about your obedience? Are you obeying the best way you know how? How about your witness? Do you have something to say about Jesus? Would you just take a moment right now this morning and just be honest with the Lord? If you're not spending time in prayer, can you just do that right now? Can you just talk to Jesus and tell him about it? Ask him to help you. Spend more time in his presence. More time being with Jesus. In prayer. In praise. In worship. in the Bible. Receive that comfort and that courage that he is with you all day long, wherever you go. Amen. The Bible says that other people will know when you have been with Jesus. It'll be obvious. They will see something different about you. You know what I think it is? I think it's boldness. I think it's bravery. Thanks for spending time with us this morning. I'll see you guys next week. Have a blessed day.